Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hello. How you doing? Good. You look good. You look Thank happy. You. Yeah. That's good. Two months of mountain stuff. Mountain stuff. Yeah. Replenishes your soul. It does. It, it does. fills your soul. Well, I'm glad to be back here with you yeah. in the studio. So many things to talk about. We'll take them one at a time. Yes? Yes. I was thinking one of the things you and I have been talking about a lot is this whole idea of what's the overarching thing that we're always talking about and thinking about, right? How do you how do you get from I don't know how to say it other than like a place where you're unhappy or you're struggling to a place where you feel like you're in control and you have agency and you're trying to solve in your own problems, you're being your own life coach. Um, From like no bueno to bueno. Yes. So what we should be talking about is the path to bueno. The path to Like bueno. how do we get to bueno? The path out of no bueno. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, same thing. Distinctions. Yeah. The, the identity and the other. Right? Yeah. Bueno? Yeah. No bueno. Yeah, in, in Europe they have signs for the cities, you know, like mm -hmm. entering, you know, Cormier. Mm -hmm. And then they have on the other side, instead of leaving Cormier, it's interdeep Cormier, meaning you're entering not, not Cormier, which is an identity, other distinction. Yes. So yes. it's like you wanna you wanna be either entering Bueno or Exiting. Exiting, no bueno. We should make more Or <laughs> entering, not, not bueno. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then it gets a little confusing. Exactly. Well, so, we, you know, you and I have talked a lot about suffering. We've talked about people struggling with things. And one of the things that we talk a lot about is how do you create a sense of agency over your own level of suffering and where does suffering come from in the first place and how does it relate to reality and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, so uh, one of the folks on the course uh, actually asked us a really important question, which was, why do I have to change my thinking? Why, why does somebody have to change their thinking? Why do people have to think differently? Mm -hmm. And the truth is you don't. You don't have to change your thinking. If everything is going swimmingly, if everything's going well, if everything's going bueno, then don't don't change your thinking. Just keep on. That's swimming. reality giving you feedback that things are good, and um, you know. But if if things are not going well, if you're in a state of no bueno, <laughs> um, which is kind of suffering of any kind you know whether you're suffering over you know worrying about your kids or whether you're worrying about your whatever it is you mean personally personally professionally, professionally globally. the job that you're trying to get yeah. the you know raise that you're trying to get mm -hmm. if you're worrying financially if you're worrying emotionally socially whatever whatever it is that's causing you suffering mm -hmm. is is the state of no bueno not good, you know. No bueno. No bueno. And so um, that's where you have to think about changing your mental models, changing your thinking. Right. And I think, I think that's a little different from how most people think about it. I think a lot of people, um, myself included for a while, go through life believing things are happening to me. Yeah. Right. That I, that everything around me is causing my no bueno. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I think it was you. And then another friend of mine who said, actually, the thing that's causing the suffering is how you're interacting with the reality of the problems you're facing. That's the cause is your, right. the hidden mental models. So the problem is no bueno, right? <laughs> yeah. If you have a, if things aren't going well, if, if you're suffering in some way, which could, you know, suffering sounds like, you know, I'm suffering. I'm like in the corner curled up, Yeah. but suffering could just be, you know, you're just not happy with the way things are. You want things to be different. I sometimes use struggling. <clears throat> struggling, yeah. suffering, you know, whatever. Um, that's the state of no bueno. That's the problem, mm -hmm. right? And and the solution, the, the cause of that problem is really important. The cause is the hidden mental models. Right. The, in other words, reality is required, but suffering is not. Suffering is optional, Right. 
And that's something that we learn a lot in the mountains, you know, like things can be, you know, and, and, and you see this in lots of different, um, areas of where people are in challenging situations in the mountains, you know, the, the, the worst people to climb mountains with are the, are the kind that when, when the suffering starts, they're complaining and they're not, you know, and the best people are the ones that are like, ah, you know, they come out of the tent and they're, it's a terrible situation, but they're, they kind of almost get energy and they, and they yeah. stay positive and they stay kind of like, Hey, you know, yes, we're in a terrible situation, but that doesn't mean we have to yeah. react terribly to it. Right. Well, it seems like the difference is the person that's like, wow, yeah. they just see that struggle as part of the reality of part their of day it. and yeah. they're just going to get they're going to get through it. They're going to find a way to move through it. Whereas another person who's like not seeing it that way is believing that it's happening to them. They have yes. no control, no agency, no motivation. Yeah. And you have tremendous agency is the point. That's the in terms of once you've recognized the problem, whatever the problem might be, personally or professionally or socially or whatever, um, then you recognize the cause and the cause is hidden mental models. And a huge part of the reason why it's so important to recognize that cause is because it gives you empowerment, the empowerment of agency, because that means if your hidden mental models are the cause, of all this suffering and all these problems, mm -hmm. then you have real agency. I don't want to say control, but yeah. influence, yeah. you know, uh, you don't have total control, but you have agency, you have influence, you have the ability to act upon mm -hmm. or react upon, you know, yeah. um, your situation. And they, these hidden mental models, sometimes in systems thinking, we use, uh, we've used for a long time, uh, the notion of a, an iceberg, you know, where you have kind of an iceberg like this. And mm -hmm. most folks, most folks every day focus on what we call the surface level events. The things that happen. Stuff that, that happens. Happening you know, I didn't get the promotion at work. I didn't, you know, my, mm -hmm. my marriage isn't going well or my kids are having trouble or whatever. And they're focused on those events. And what they don't see is underneath. You know, they see the top of the iceberg, but they don't see the, the, the beneath the iceberg, beneath the thing that's showing is a lot more There's stuff. There's more stuff. Under There's there. more hidden yeah. stuff. So all of this for most folks is hidden from our view. And what we need to do is is understand, you know, be able to sort of make this less hidden, see more of it. And so what is it? It's pattern, right? Mm -hmm. That events tied together make a pattern. If right. you have two events, that's the minimal pattern. And so, you know, the classic example is I'm in this terrible relationship with my boyfriend or girlfriend or, you yeah, know, yeah. My, my significant other. And it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, but this is the fourth one that you've had that's right. like this. So the names have changed. The events have changed. You know, it went from Bill to Bob to yeah. Frank to John. Mm -hmm. So you think, oh, th those are all different people. But actually, no, they're all kind of the same. I'm getting involved in the same. same patterned relationship. And I've been in this one four times. Or I keep getting into the same job situation, yeah. you know. Wait, and yeah. Right? So you're seeing this pattern level. And that's where you start to see that, oh, there's a there's a pattern to the events. Yeah, but even that's hard to see. Really hard to because see. Because this yeah. is so seductive and so easy up here. Totally. Right? So And, and bothersome. I mean, right? how many times have I talked to colleagues or friends and said, you realize you did this last year. Yeah. You realize that happened six months ago. You re and, and 100%. It's a real pause moment. And, oh, yeah, so it's hard, it's hard just to get to this level. Yeah. Yeah. With young people, they, they have a hard time seeing those patterns, yeah. right? Because they, they haven't lived long enough to sort of yeah. get the perspective of, oh, yeah, this is repeating. this Because yeah. to them, it feels all new, yeah. right? The the new girlfriend or the new boyfriend or the new whatever is, is new. So yeah. it's new, exciting, different. And you're like, yeah, but underneath, yeah. it's not new. It's the same 
signal that you're sending out, you're attracting the same people, you're getting involved in the same kinds of relationships. Yeah, but it's even things like, oh, it's the new school year. New and it's like, year, oh, my yeah. study habits are the same as last year or the same as the year before. Yes. You know, so it's it's not just the interpersonal. No, no, no. It's no, no. all it's kinds of anything. Stuff. Yeah. Anything. I mean, it could be eating habits. It could be, oh, any, yeah. you know, anything that anything that can be patterned, which is anything. Yeah. Um, I'm just using examples of yeah, relationships because I think sometimes people, you know, have visceral uh, <laughs> awesome. r- memories of those kinds of things. But then what's what's unique is um, there's something more that you have to pay attention to than patterns because the thing that is driving those patterns, which is driving those events, we call structure or structures. Right. And in systems thinking, there's a there's a very old uh, saying that is is something that we should all sort of heed which is structure determines behavior. Structure determines behavior. So this is the world of behavior up here. You've got all these behaviors happening and some of them you like and some of them you don't. Some of them are yours, some of them are other people's. But generally speaking, you know, the events that happen in the world, somebody on the subway or somebody in a car or, you know, oh, I don't like that or I do like that, whatever. Uh, Those are all the land of behaviors. But what we want to see is the pattern that's driving those behaviors. And then we want to see the structure that's driving those patterns to drive those behaviors or those events. You know, behaviors are one part of events. And you can mean literally Mm -hmm. physical structure. You can mean social social structures, any kind of structure. So I have a good example. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this in one of our classes at Cornell, which is the nursing stations. Remember that study yeah. on nursing stations mm-hmm. where it was literally um, they did studies on mortality rates uh, in one wing of a hospital. And what they determined was one of the biggest causes was doctor nurse communication patterns. Right. Patterns. So what they did is they actually changed the physical structure of the nursing stations so that the nurses were actually facing out to the doctor so that the moment the doctor came out of a patient with the chart, there's this structure that facilitates that conversation. And over time, what they found was that actually that structural change decreased mortality. Mortality, So that's what you mean when structure. Yeah, that's that's kind of a deep structure. I mean, structure is in the way classrooms are organized. Yeah, structure right. is in the way society is organized. Structure is in the way that we organize the rules of the road. You that's know, the, right. all those things are structural and, and if we, behavior. and they shape behavior, mm-hmm. right? They shape the pattern of behavior. And so we wanna pay attention to those structures. When you wanna see them. You wanna see them, but yeah. First and foremost, you wanna get them not hidden, you know? And then, and then there's one more thing that's underneath structures, and this is where, where the rubber meets the road kind of thing, and that's called mental models. Right. And that's the crux of the whole thing, which is that our mental models are the thing that roll up into structures. The reason that things are structured the way they are is because of the way we think about them. We right. think they're a certain way, so we structure things in that way. And then those structures lead to patterns, and those patterns lead to events or right. behaviors or situations or yeah. surface level stuff. And your classic example of that was classroom design. Yeah. I mean, a classic example is you've got a classroom that's, you know, you've got the teacher up front and you've got, you know, rows of, of students sitting, you know, stadium style. Mm hmm. Well, that's be that structure, which we pay a lot of money to build a really fancy classroom with you know stuff up front. Mm-hmm. That structure is based on what our mental model of how learning happens. Right. Now the question is: Is that really the best way that learning happens? You know, where this person talks and these people mostly listen. Well, mm-hmm. we know, for example, that there's more neurons hooked up to the hands and the and the eyes. Than uh, and the tongue and mm-hmm. than the rest of your body, right? So if you really want to speak into the brain, the ears are kind of not the best yeah. way to access the brain. And yet yeah. this whole structure is is based on a mental model of how learning happens. Mm-hmm. What we'd probably want to do if we were going to really build a classroom or you know a, a learning environment is have it be completely modular. Every single surface, every single wall would be whiteboard so people can use their hands and post-it notes and visual and, and kids can be up at the board drawing, mm-hmm. visualizing, right, little pods of kids. And then you'd have desks or tables that could be modularized so you could have them be separate 
Yep. Or you could have them all be together into one big one, you know. Well, yeah. Or, you know, or you could have them be in a circle or you could have them be in this format and you could you could modularly adapt, adapt the room to the many different ways that we can learn. Yes. I'm not even sure you'd have chairs. You'd, you'd have maybe some balls for people to sit bouncy on, balls. bouncy balls Energy. or something like that. Some yeah. kind of sitting device for when people want to sit, but people could sit and stand and move around because movement's so important. And, you know, a lot of the behavioral problems we're seeing in schools today yeah. is because we're forcing young children to sit for hours and hours and hours. And I mean, that's just literally a mental model that leads to structure, that leads to pattern behavior. And then we're surprised yeah. when we're like, why are we having behavioral problems? Yeah. Well, because you're making them sit Why are they antsy? Why are they why antsy? Are they not focused? Are they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I wanted to hit on before we move any further is I would imagine, so most of, a lot of our, our previous episodes were about just the power of mental models, seeing your mental models. Mm-hmm. And I think this idea that they're hidden Mm -hmm. is new and not only that but that they're hidden under these other layers yes so now we're saying realize that your mental models are the driver across these three levels and that our bias is to live up here yes but to change what's happening up here we have to change yes down here right we have to see those mental models and a lot of the mental models you know when we think about our thinking or we think about mental models which is the same thing we think, oh, you know, I know what I'm thinking. No, you don't. You don't know. Yeah. A lot of what you're thinking is happening subconsciously. A right. lot of what you're ha- thinking is happening autonomically, yeah. automatically. Yeah. So, part of the reason they're hidden is because they're so they're they're so automatic. Yes. They're so ingrained in you that they just happen. And just having a little bit of awareness about what you're thinking, what your mental models are. The research on on what's called metacognition, yeah. which is just awareness of your mental models, yeah. essentially, um, is is pretty clear that it, it improves performance in all walks of life, in all domains, right. personal and professional. So if we just get a little less hidden, mm-hmm. if we just make these mental models a little less hidden, then we open up the possibility of changing these structures, changing these mental models, which changes the structures, changes the patterns, and changes the events. Yeah, and I would imagine um, some of the mental models that, I don't want to say get us into trouble, that that cause maybe some of the struggles up here are, are so not only are they self-conscious, but sometimes, like I imagine, I mean, we were Subconscious. Just, so what did I say? Self-conscious. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Subconscious. <laughs> Subconscious, yeah. <laughs> I would imagine that so, for example, I think about like we were just uh, hiking, yeah. And I was, I, I'm terrified of heights. Yes. Right? Well, that's a mental model, but that's a mental model that's coming from fear. Yes. Right. And I would imagine there's a sort of almost a set of um, mental models that are not just subconscious, but that are autonomic from places of, uh, I want to say, irrationality or, I don't know how to. Yeah, sometimes it. sometimes I use the acronym just so that I can remember it myself. Some of the, the some of the big things, a facade, and a facade is kind of a fake front of a building, right? Mm-hmm. Like you know, right. you might like the old town western movies are facades, the right? Behind yeah. behind the movie set, there's nothing there, but right. you've got the this whole western town. <laughs> um, but when you walk through the door, it's, it's just like desert, <laughs> right? So facade is fears, right? Yeah. And then assumptions, so things we assume. Yeah. And then cravings, things we crave or, uh, you know, want, desires, that, that type of thing. Um, Anxiety. And then, uh, no, this would be uh, aversions, things oh. we try to stay away from, like- right? That yeah, we don't want to believe. We don't want to believe, or yeah. whatever. And then this would be delusions, things that we want to delude ourselves into believing. Like so, this would be things like beliefs and yeah. other things. And this can be emotions yeah. or expectations. Oh yeah. And this isn't. Uh, this is just sort of a a new moment, a new new mnemonic, mnemonic device. device to just remember some of the things that really, really influence our mental models. Right. So we have these facade like hidden mental models that are being influenced by fear, 
things that we assume to be the case, things that we want to be the case, things that we're trying to avoid being the case, things that we really, really want to believe. Yeah. And then our emotions have a huge impact and our expectations is like we're painting a picture of the future and then the present right. doesn't match the future. And, and so these things are all influencing our mental models, oftentimes without us knowing about it. Yes. And so what we want to do again is just make these things a little bit more, just increase our awareness by just a, a few percentage points is going to make huge differences. So I'm wondering if that means, Derek, that when you are saying to yourself, oh, something's not working in my yeah. life, I'm struggling with something. And I say I go back to like this event happened and here's how it's a pattern and I'm starting to see the structures. And I'm like, OK, well, what's the mental model? If you do that extra step to say, is this mental model sort of rooted in these things? In one of these things. What am I afraid of? What am yeah. I what are my assumptions? And how real is how, how rational? many expectations do I have? Yeah. That gives you a little more um what's the word? I don't want to say um, you know, like leverage or it really just gives you a little bit more awareness. I mean, your example of the of being afraid of heights, right? Yeah. Well, being afraid of heights is a pretty good fear. It's 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 a age old fear, and yeah. there's a reason you should be afraid of heights because if you fall off stuff, yeah, it's not good. Sorry, it's weird because I'm very sort of self aware. Yeah. But there's a moment where it takes over. It like, takes I over. I literally can't be rational. Exactly. It's just I cannot. So if you remember when we were on the trail and there was a pretty good sizable thousand foot drop sloping <laughs> down like this and we had like a, you know, maybe a 36 inch tread of trail here and then a cliff here and you were getting a little bit, you're standing here like this. Yeah, yeah. And I said at that moment, I said, you know, you, you're having a fear of heights, mm -hmm. right? And you are imagining in your head, you have this imagination that goes with the fear of heights, yeah. right? So you're building a mental model, which is if I misstep and fall, I'm going to be like Princess Bride rolling down the hill, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 feet to my death. Right. Now, in some cases, that's right. If you're on a cliff face and yeah. you fall and you're not roped or whatever, yeah, that that's absolutely right. But in this particular case, if you fall, like if you trip or yeah. something like that, you're, you're probably going to just like land on the trail. Yes. So I said to you, just pre like do kind of a pretend fall. Like what's going to happen if you just yeah. you, you kind of sit down on the trail? Yeah. That's what actually happens. Yes. So you can challenge your mental models if they need to be challenged right right again if 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 you if there really is a 3000 foot drop and and there is then that no mental model then helpful. that mental model <laughs> you know pretty helpful but in this particular case <clears throat> the mental model you're building around your fears and around your imagination yeah. is not an accurate mental model of what's actually going to happen. So you of can the kinda, reality. Of, of the, the reality of the situation. Right. Yeah. Right. And so once you did that, you're like, oh, OK. It, it's not like one false step leads to death. One false step equals death. Right? Yeah. That's not the equation. I still didn't like it. it yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's jarring. It's an example. Yeah, so when you talk about um, what we call suffering or struggling, we're saying a lot of that is because of a mismatch between how you're thinking about something and the reality of that thing, right? So what we've talked about so far is the problem, right? And the problem is, you know, in short, no bueno suffering, mm -hmm. right? So this this tells you whether you need to change your thinking or not because right. you don't like the way things are, mm -hmm. right? And then we talked about the cause. Well, the cause is your hidden mental models. That's the cause. Right. The cause is you're focused on events and and as a result of that focus you're missing the underlying mental models that are hidden that are often hidden from your consciousness or from your view. Right. right. Well, the solution is the is is the cessation of that of those that cause, right? Yes. And the solution is what we call love reality. And the reason that love reality is so powerful is because you have reality and you have your mental models. Mm -hmm. And if you try to fit reality 
if you try to do this, fit reality to your mental models, that is literally called confirmation bias. Yeah. Right? And confirmation bias is one of the most important biases that we have. Right? And that's if you try to fit reality to your mental model. And that's delusion. Yeah, that's delusion. <laughs> that's absolutely that's delusional. Right? right? Yeah. Now, it, what we want to do is go the other way, which is we want to fit our mental model to reality. Right. Right? We want the fit to go this way. Yeah. And that is going to get your mental model to be more and more in alignment. So what this is going to do is it's going to make reality and your mental model more and more in alignment, more in, in parallel. Right. And then you're going to get things right more often, right? Yes. So and that's that what we want to do. Suffering. Yes. Yes. Because suffering comes from that mismatch. It comes from the mismatch. Yeah. Yes. Suffering comes from the mismatch between between reality think. and your mental models. Right. And reality is well, the beautiful thing about reality, and that's kind of why I like the idea of love reality because you really there's the love part and then there's the reality part and the two together. But the love part is reality is very loving. It'll constantly give you feedback. Mm -hmm. It'll never stop giving you feedback. It's persistent. It's very persistent. And if you're listening to the feedback that it's giving you, it'll tell you exactly what you need to do differently. Yeah. But you got to listen to it. And that's sometimes hard for us because we're listening to our own internal yeah. voice, yes. facade type voices. Yeah. We're listening to our own internal mental models. Yeah. So we're listening to the inside voice rather than the outside voice. And the outside voice is reality and bumping up against the reality yes. of, the, of the situation, of the world, of the events, of whatever. Well, we're listening to this and we're only seeing this yeah. at the same time. Yes. And then... We're doing this retrofitting. Yeah, we retrofit yeah. reality to our mental model, which gives us confirmation bias, which makes us feel good because it makes us feel right. Yeah. And we love to be right. Right? Yeah. But then over time, feeling right when you're actually wrong has really negative consequences, which is why you get to the no bueno state. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Full circle. It's, yeah, it comes full circle. So yeah. the so the that's the solution. The solution is love reality. Get your mental models in alignment with reality. We call this the love reality loop mm -hmm. because you know fitting your mental model to reality is 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 a cyclical thing. You you do it and then you change it again and you get more feedback and you change it again and you, and you always want to go this direction. Mm -hmm. You don't want to fit. Right. reality to your mental model that's right? just going to make everything worse that's right and yeah and you'll get you'll learn that the hard way and then Actually. once once we've established the solution then what we have to do is understand the importance and and the and the purpose of practice because just knowing this solution is not enough you've got to practice I mean practice getting Practice seeing your mental models. Practice testing your mental models. Practice l practice right. loving reality. Yeah. Practice seeing this oh, yeah. hidden stuff. Yeah. Practice this loop. Mm -hmm. And most of all, practice the idea of organizing the information of the events, right? So there's the events is all this information, organizing it in a way that's more like the way reality is organizing it. So right. we sometimes will say that um, mental models are equal to information and organization. The way we organize information is how we make meaning or mental models. And what we wanna do is really focus on what is the information of the event, mm -hmm. how how can I organize it so that it, it characterizes what happened in the event in the most real way possible rather than in the way that I want to organize it, which is I'm right. They're all wrong. They're all idiots. You know, everybody's stupid yeah. except me. And, you know, I'm I pretty much have this figured out. And if they'd all just listen to me, then we'd be fine. Right. Yes. That's one way we might want to organize events. Right. Yes. Or. This is a disaster. This wedding, my wedding's a disaster. Mm -hmm. It's not the way I wanted it. Maybe, or maybe, maybe this is going to bring people together because it didn't go completely perfectly. And maybe perfect isn't right. <laughs> maybe perfect isn't what you're seeking. Maybe, maybe human is what you're looking for. Yeah, maybe you know? imperfect. Yeah, maybe perfect. Yeah. So, uh, and what we know about this practice 
is that there's a Pareto law. Right. And the Pareto law just means that there's an 80-20 rule, meaning like you, you can get 80% of the benefit with 20% of the effort. Right. And that Pareto law is what we call the big five, big five plus moves, mental yes. moves. Yes. And that, if you practice those moves, mm -hmm. you're going to get better at getting a mental model that is more in alignment with reality. And we know right. this from experimental right. research. Because the big five moves are a way to, um, for lack of whatever, sort of like interrogate and test. Yes. The veracity of your mental models in, in relation, a systemic way, in relation to reality. Yes, in a, right. in relation to yes. reality, which is systemic and non bivalent, and a lot, a lot of other things, webs of causality that are true about reality. That you will that the five moves will help you see the interconnectivity mm -hmm. and the web of causality that's leading to these events and things like that. Right. So those five moves are uh, is is not list. Uh, zoom, zoom in, in zoom, zoom out. out. Uh, park party. Yep. RDS. Parts like the party. Uh, RDS barbell. And perspective circle, which we sometimes call P circle. Yes. And then the plus of the five plus is the once you've learned each of these moves, which takes you know minutes to learn, and then you can practice, 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 just like you would do yeah. any physical fitness. You do the mental moves, mm -hmm. just like you. A mental move is like a mental, the mental equivalent of like a push up or yes. a sit up or a bench press or something like that. It's a way to get stronger mentally. So you're developing mental fitness as you're practicing these five moves. These are the both five most important moves. And once you're done with the five, you can start using them together. And that's the plus. We call that the mashup. So yeah. you're just mashing them up into yes. different combinations. Yes. And the most important thing is what, right here, you just you just outlined the path. To bueno. To bueno. Yeah. Right? This is bueno. That's literally the path out of no bueno and into bueno. From no bueno. <laughs> I wish I could draw like little footsteps. Da, 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 da. To bueno. Yeah, that's how you get from no bueno to bueno. We taught them the path to bueno. Excellent. There you go. That's the path to bueno. Very exciting. Now, hopefully, you'll get on this path and do the things that were outlined here. Yeah. What else have we got going on? Oh, we're still in the top 3%. Yes. And we love you for that. And Moving we slowly that. downward in that 3%. Downward late towards two. To towards two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Takes a little bit of time, but yes, we're making headway, which yes. is great. We have successfully completed our first systems thinking in nature hiking in the Alps excursion. Yeah. Which yeah. was good. We're pilot testing, uh, you know, teaching systems thinking in the context of the mountains and trekking. Yep. And that's been really fun this summer. Um, that's yeah. something that kind of brings to, the, to my world to as us. a guide and my world as a scientist together. And we had a really successful trip to the yeah. Alps, which was fantastic. I conquered my fears. Maybe we'll do a podcast on that if people we are will. interested. And we're yes. about to release a new course on the five moves yeah. in the on next these. couple of weeks. Yeah. And we have our first cohort for coaching starting yes. in October. We got Absolutely. a lot of stuff happening. A lot of stuff happening. And it's all for you anytime. Yep. Anything you want, we got it. Right? Excellent. All right. So is that a wrap? That's a wrap.